Um, you know, it's just been an embarrassment of riches. Um, I've received at least three phone calls from media outlets saying, how did Botticelli do? I said, we just sent it to Boston two days ago. <laughs> we need a little time to, uh, to realize exactly how well, well we, you know, we have some ideas, but I don't want to put out any numbers or any things uh, before we have the actual data. So, suffice to say that we know in some categories we did eclipse what we did for Leonardo. But in the end, I want to see how much. Like, we sold out of the soft cover catalog a month before the show ended. We sold out of the hardcover catalog two weeks before the show ended. We sold the damaged copies <laughs> uh, in the last two weeks, for sure. And then um, we know we eclipsed the uh, ticket sales at the door uh, about four weeks ago as well. But in terms of how we count the overall attendance and the media impression and everything else, um, you know, we want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. So in some places, you know, the idea of attendance being the measure of success is really kind of bogus. I mean, it is the measure of something, but um, it's not ultimately the measure of the success. When you, when you have people that are engaged with a work of art in a way that's so meaningful, that's really, you know, that's really where our success is. The numbers are just kind of shameless. So, um, and then everybody's asking me this same thing. You can imagine, this just gets on your nerves, right? Like, well, what are you going to do next? My answer is, can I just retire? Uh, so, uh, like I said, it's been an embarrassment of riches, and of course, we've already been working on what we're doing next, and so next is twofold. Next is, in two weeks, what do we open? And so, uh, in the space upstairs, uh, we will be opening a collection of Chinese antiquities that were given to us, a very, very wonderful collection. Um, it was given to us last year. We haven't had a chance to celebrate it. These are, these are first rate. They've been at the Metropolitan Museum. The collectors, which I'm not going to tell you who they are, they want to remain anonymous, have worked currently at the Metropolitan Museum, so that gives you an idea of the level of quality. Um, it'll be very dramatic upstairs. Stairs. We've involved our students uh, in that exhibition. And so um, I think right now the plan is that when you come to the last and final third Thursday on April 20th, right? You don't have to figure out what that is. We're going to hear from Marco Grassi, who uh, discovered uh, the Bronzino, and also another work and how conservation and restoration can lend itself to understanding the authorship of a work of art. Um, he will be the speaker that night on um, April 20th. We will then probably after that with the, uh, the EDB uh, reception have a little opening for the antiquities show upstairs. And these things are fantastic. They, they range from the 4th century BC to the Ming period, which is about 1368 or so. Downstairs in the small gallery here, we're taking the prints down and we're going to show, celebrate another new collection that's coming to us, you know, continue the embarrassment of riches. And these are scholar's rocks, Chinese scholar's rocks. Anybody know what a scholar's rock is by any chance? Well, they're uh, natural formations. I don't want to call them sculptures because that's not really what they are, but they're natural, they're different kinds of stone, they come from different parts of China, they're usually discovered. And then they're, they're, they're sort of intriguing in their shape, their contour, the negative spaces, the positive spaces, and all this stuff. So as a Buddhist, you would uh, contemplate them. You contemplate the shape and the form and the surface and all this stuff. They're stunningly beautiful, but what's really interested, interesting about this, and many of you will relate to this, is they are married. That is the word that's used. They're married to their base for life. So um, a lot of times it's the rocks can be millions of years old, obviously, but it depends on when they're found and when they're used as scholars' rocks. They can be anywhere from the Renaissance into the 16th, 17th, 18th century, or even more modern rocks. But the geological formations of them are also, and so students are involved in that as well. We're very happy because that helps to actualize our goal of the museum as a laboratory for experiential learning. Looking ahead to the new year, now, when you live in some, you've heard me say this, when you live in semesters, the new year starts in August. So we will have all this up over the summer, but we're trying to take a breath and work on things um, for the next year. Uh, we will open, I believe, in this gallery uh, on August 31st, September 1st. 
what will be the 50th anniversary of the college's celebration of the 50th anniversary of the graduation of the first African Americans from the college. This is a big year-long celebration in 17, and then in 18 is the 100th anniversary of the graduation of the first women from the college. And so the museum is all part of those celebrations, and our part of that, besides some bigger things, are to show our collections of works by African American artists in our collection, which are pretty fantastic, and then later in the year show the works of the women in our collection. So there'll be some bigger campus-wide celebrations, but that's what we're looking at. And upstairs in uh, August, September, we're looking at either showing our collection of American modernism, which hasn't been out, uh, or we have a couple other options that we're still thinking about. This is the final Tuesday uh, topics in architecture. I really, really appreciate very much what Ed Peace has done and what David Brashear has done. We appreciate the fact that the MCV Foundation and VCU have uh, underwritten this program. Just so you don't forget, Wine and Run for the Roses is the first Saturday. Derby Day is the first Saturday in May. Uh, tickets are available. There's two tiers of tickets. Uh, it's the most fantastic event in this whole region and area, and we invite you to come. You can go to our website and see all that's available. If wine and uh, running a horse is not your flavor, the next day is our barbecue beer and bluegrass. It's our big community engagement day. So this is the day we give back to the community. It's uh, not so much a fundraiser, but all kinds of people come, families, children. It's really been great. Last year it happened on Mother's Day. It was, people thought it was going to be a catastrophe, but we had like 400 people showed up and we raffled off 30-some things to moms that day. It was great. So um, there's four five kinds of barbecue. There will be a chef's corral as part of this, a focus on the Virginia Beer Company beers. And so um, we really invite you to celebrate that with us here. And then you know, the museum goes a little quiet. So we do so much appreciate the MCV Foundation and VCU who are the sponsors of the Wine and Run for the Roses. And then we are in a partnership with the Chamber of Commerce and the catering company on the barbecue day. So, Anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, we want to welcome Ed Pease to the stage. Anybody, while I'm up here, I'm happy. All right, well, Ed Pease is not unfamiliar to you all. He's given several lectures here. He, is the, he teaches the architecture classes here. He's a professor in the Art and History program. And so um, today we're going to see sort of another part of what David Bashir talked about before, this influence of Frank Lloyd Wright on the work of E. Faye Jones, who... Join me in welcoming and peace. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Thanks for everybody coming out. Familiar faces. I just have to ask this: How many in the room have heard? Can you hear me okay. Have heard of Efe Jones? Twenty percent. Good. That's great. So the rest of you get to be entertained with something totally unexpected, I think. Um, uh, for those of you who were here a month ago to see David Bashir's lecture on Frank Lloyd Wright and his influence on the group of Australian architects, that was a really fascinating talk. Where he talked about three architects primarily that I had never heard of, and to see how his influence translated to Australia really quite interesting. And as part of that lecture, he showed quite a bit of Frank Lloyd Wright's residential work, um, just so you don't aren't disappointed or waiting for it. I'm not going to show a great deal of Wright's work tonight. And um, we're going to show some, and that doesn't take away from the fact that Wright was hugely influential on Faye Jones. But his influence was really primarily philosophical. Um, it was his principles of organic architecture that Jones was a complete adherent to and advocate for his entire career. So that's, yeah, if you want to see a lot of Frank Rice work, we'll have to do another lecture. But uh, we will see some. But okay, let's get started. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's step back. Uh, to the 1930s. This is uh, this picture is a little bit earlier than that. This is probably taken in the early 20s. This is El Dorado, Arkansas. And when uh, uh, Faye Jones was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas in 1921, but his 
family in 1929 and 30, and you all know what was happening in 1929 and 30, it was a pretty bad time. But they moved to El Dorado, which strangely was a boom town, insofar as you have boom towns in rural Arkansas. But it was a boom town because they discovered oil. So his father opened a restaurant two buildings down from the Rialto Theater. So this is kind of his context as a young man. So um, it was at that theater that Jones was first introduced to this person, not physically, but that he heard of, Frank Lloyd Wright. So um, I, have a, I have some quotes that I'm going to read tonight. Most of them are from Jones himself, so I hope you'll bear with me, but they're quite good. And he wasn't a writer. Uh, so the quotes come from conversations and interviews and things like that. So, but I think there's some of them are it's really poignant to hear it in his own voice. So this is Faye Jennings talking about his first introduction to Frockwood, right? Quote, says Jones, when I was a senior in high school, I went to the movie one day and there was this short subject called popular science. The subject of the film was this new building that was being built in Racine, Wisconsin, the Johnson Wax Building. I had never seen anything like it before except in Buck Rogers or a Flash Gordon comic strip. Buildings of the 21st century. It was a building really being built here and now in the United States, and of course that was the first time I'd ever heard the name Frank Lloyd Wright. The film talked about the building not only in terms of unique construction, but about the aspect of the building as a work of art. So here it was, all coming together for me. A building can be an art form. Suddenly I knew that it was a career in architecture that I wanted to pursue. Architecture was not a totally new word to me, but it took on a new meaning that day. So, I love to imagine this 17-year-old kid from the Ozarks being in the movie theater and seeing this building. This is the Johnson Wax Building, which was extraordinary then, and it's still an extraordinary building. Um, the use of tubular glass and the style of works space, I mean, it was really, truly something out of the future. So that's just, that's, you know, I love to see that Rialto Theater and Jones is coming in as someone who liked to build, he liked to draw, but he had just never heard of Frank Lloyd Wright. He'd been around, he was quite famous. He'd probably had two careers by 1938. Um, but Jones first hears of him. So the Johnson Wax Building, it's really still, as I said, just a stunning building. I look at some of these, some of the details, the technical details, and I'm just continually amazed how adventurous Wright was and how, what a risk taker. I mean, this is, how he got things built is just nothing short of the miraculous many times. But so, this was the powerful influence on him, Jones. So let's flash, fast forward about 40, 45 years and talk a little bit about the context of, in the architectural world when Jones's work became publicly known. So in the 80s, if you can all remember the 80s, you probably don't think about it architecturally speaking, but it was a really rancorous time in the architecture world. Postmodernism was at a high point, and the ideologues on the postmodern side and the modern side were debating, and it's just, you know, the New York Five, it's, uh, Charles Moore, Michael Graves, I mean, all this, there was, it was, it was heady time, and it was interesting and really exciting in many ways. But there was some kind of crazy architecture that came as a result of that. These are two really sort of iconic postmodern buildings. The Portland building on the left, Michael Graves, 82, and the Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans by Charles Moore. So, granted, I did choose some more of the flamboyant postmodern buildings and they weren't all that quite like this. These are, you know, as I said, they're out there on the other end of the spectrum. But it does tell you sort of where things were. And there were, to be fair, there were still modernist architects practicing and doing great buildings. I am Pei, uh, Caesar Pelli, Richard Meyer, Skid Morrow and Merrill. There was, you know, modernism hadn't died, but it was under heavy fire. So this is, this is the context. And as a grad student at Virginia Tech at that time, this stuff was just in the air, for better or for worse. So it's like, what is all this crazy stuff? 
And so then, suddenly this building appears in the architectural press. And it's like, oh, gosh, it really, I, I, you know, it was just, it was a really, just a, it was a profoundly different kind of building that had been published in any time in, in our lifetimes, I think, as an architecture student, that short lifetime then. Um, and, you know, I think it was, uh, for, for me and many of my friends, this was just, it was something really, really exciting and powerful, just to, even just through photographs, not even being there, you can just tell this architect, whoever he was, no one had ever heard of it. He is, was masterful in his use of natural light, just the structural rigor and exuberance was just, again, this is such a, on the one hand it looks familiar and kind of old, and yet it's something really, really different and new. So, when I saw that building, I said quietly to myself, I want to see the building and I want to meet this architect. So. Um, Bear with me for about a minute. I'll keep it really short. I'm going to inject a little bit of a personal note. So I did. I, I um, had met Faye Jones at a lecture at the Smithsonian, and um, probably a year later after that building was published. And um, he was really nice, and he said, if you're ever in the area, you should come by. So I did with an Icelandic friend who was a grad student. We made a road trip, which was uh, wonderful and hilarious thing in itself, and we went and spent a couple of days in Fayetteville, and he was very nice, invited us in the office and all that. So, of course, my prime motive, I really wanted to work for this guy, so I didn't, I was trying to keep it somewhat subtle, so I would write letters, and again, this is pre-internet, no email, so you write letters, and he was, I still had, I guess I had three of the letters he wrote back, he was always responsive. And eventually, when I first asked him, you know, or sort of asked for a job, basically, he said, no, we're not expanding the office now. I just can't put anyone else in the payroll. But thank you. I really appreciate it. Get back in touch with me in, in a year. So I did. And um, at that point, he said, no, we're still, we haven't added anyone. And I'm not sure we're going to be doing it in your future. But for you to move down here is a really big deal. You're going to move your family. And you're going to come to Fayetteville, Arkansas. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a, quite a move. Um, I suggest you come here, come stay here for about a week and spend some time in the office and just see, see if you like it. So, heck yeah, I did. So, and I so made my plans, drove by myself this time, got a room at the Chief Motel, which I was amazed I could find that. <laughs> and um, so, dropped my stuff there, worked for, went to the office on a Monday and Tuesday and just did various tasks, red lines, and worked on a model of another chapel, I don't remember which one it was, went to a couple of construction sites, and Jones wasn't really around that much early in the week, so he came in probably on a Wednesday, and um, so we talked, and eventually he said, so where are you staying? I said, at the Chief Motel, and he said, hmm, that, that won't do, why don't you stay with us, come to my house, and stay with, stay with my wife and I, so that was like, fantastic, so I did, so the next couple of nights I stayed with him. And they were terrific. His wife's name is, the nickname is Gus. And uh, they were just extremely gracious. And so, all that's to say that I do have a really personal connection here to this man. And, and um, I, I have to say, it's, it, my conversation with, with uh, David Bashir as we were sort of throwing ideas about um, what these talks could be, I have to admit, Faye Jones didn't come to mind and right away. And yet, it was the perfect kind of segue, or it seemed to be, from his interest in the Australian architects, but it's been really quite a trip down memory lane for me, looking through all these photographs, and I, you know, I have to admit, my, my awareness of him had dimmed, of his work, it had just sort of faded, and so it's been great to sort of reintroduce myself, and I'm happy I can introduce him to many of you who don't know him. Okay, so, enough of that. So, um, as from the title of the Talk, it's very clear that Frank Lloyd Wright was a huge influence on Jones. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief um, bio that led to, to, to Jones meeting him. So Jones sees the movie, gets excited about architecture, applies to the University of Arkansas, which at that time had engineering. So he goes to engineering school, architectural engineering. For three years, World War II has begun, so he joins the Navy, stays in the Navy several years to the war's over 
comes back, finishes degree at Arkansas, then gets a two-year fellowship at Rice to study architecture at Rice University in Houston. So that was um, that was a really big deal. And while he was there, he read about. Um, of course, the whole time he'd been studying about Frank Lloyd Wright and had seen his buildings. He had not been to Taliesin, which, for those of you who don't know, uh, Taliesin Wright had built two residences slash sort of studios, workspace. One in Wisconsin, Spring Green, and one in Scottsdale, Arizona. So Scottsdale was kind of Wright's base at that time. I don't think Jones had been to visit there, but he certainly knew of it and seen the buildings. But while he was at Rice, he had been reading about another architect. Bruce Goff. How many people have heard of Bruce Goff? Oh, Just a couple. Yeah, Bruce Goff is amazing. So, yeah, he's sort of fallen off to the radar and is deep in. I mean, you study him in architectural history, but he's, uh, he's not a household name either, um, less so probably than Faye Jones. But John, he was a highly creative architect and one of the few architects that Wright really admired. Public people would say so. Bruce Goff, that was a rare thing. Wright was not one to hand out compliments. And Goff, he was impressed and he liked Goff. So Jones, of course, reads that and says, I want to meet this Bruce Goff guy. So he goes to uh, Oklahoma, meets Goff, really had a great visit there. And he's transitioning out of his fellowship at Rice. And so a few weeks later, after he met Bruce Goff, Goff offers him a teaching job at Oklahoma. So um, he says, yeah, I'll go there. So he goes to Oklahoma, and that's where he met Wright. And Wright came for a lecture. So Jones meets Wright, um, and they hit it off quite well, and Wright expressed an interest in coming to Taliesin. So a few months later, Wright calls him and says, why don't you bring your family out here and live and work with us for a while? So he did that, and he was there for four months, and that was a profound experience for him and really shaped uh, and it's solidified his views about Wright and his understanding of organic architecture. So that was a really big deal. So we'll get back to Wright in a second, but um, well actually I'll take that. Let me let's let's spend a minute of the time Wright, I mean uh, Jones going to Taliesin. So there's four months he's there. Um, he works on two buildings. He works on the Price Tower in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Robert Powell and Wright House in Bethesda, Maryland. So those are pretty significant buildings for Wright and a great opportunity for Jones to, Jones to work on. Um, and I think that his, his time there, again, confirmed his status, Jones' status as a Wright, Wright disciple. Um, and he never really wavered from that. In fact, his, a lot of people say that his time spent at Taliesin, just the lessons he learned about from that building specifically, showed up in his own house that he built in 1955 at Arkansas. So this is the one I stayed in, and I was telling some people earlier, I was so nervous, I couldn't bear to bring my camera out and get photographs. So this is kind of a bad internet photo. But um, anyway, you can very much see the right influence here with the exposed rafters and this uh, light-colored roofs and the stonework is very reminiscent of Wright. So uh, one quote from Jones allegedly he said, I've never tried to be a little Frank Lloyd Wright. And I think the reason for that, uh, probably a number of things, but his own education was very different from Wright's. He did study engineering. And uh, just his experiences living in small towns in Arkansas, it just, it, it allowed him to just be a really different person and to build on Wright's ideas. And um, I think you can see this uh, the structural expressionism that Jones eventually got into, I think, stems directly from this engineering background. Um, so, and we'll, we will pick back and we'll get back to Wright in a minute, but just a brief little look at page, uh, Bruce Goff. So, Bruce Goff was an incredibly creative guy. and. Um, his, every building of his was vastly different from the one before. He was just this you know, hugely creative person. And I've, I've read this in a number of places, so I'm taking it as fact. That, and he, he gives credit to his time spent in the Navy. He joined the Navy as well during the World War II. And he worked in the construction branch of the Navy, the Seabees. And he was stationed in the Aleutian Islands, which is that's as far out of the... If the Ozarks are... Isolated, the Aleutian Islands are way, way, way isolated. 
know, he was in charge of building buildings and repairing buildings, and so you just can't make a phone call and get your load of steel to come make a repair. So he had to be incredibly resourceful. So he became really adept at recycling and repurposing materials, using materials that were intended for one thing in a totally different way, out of necessity. And he carried, I think that was, must have been just a wonderful ex experiment for him to be able to work like that. He carried that through into his building. So I'll go through this kind of quickly. You can just see the range of things. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of stuff on, on Bruce Goff on the web. There's a number of good books about him. One of them is listed on that handout I gave you. Um, I won't talk too much about these individual ones. You can ask questions. So this particular one, and you'll see it in the next house too. He just used such strange materials. You see, when I first started looking at these, I saw this black rock. I thought, what is that? What kind of stone is it? And then this strange crystal looking stuff. And what that is, the glass, is called colored glass, which is intended to be recycled. So it's just big, giant blobs of glass. So I guess you get it for almost free or very cheap. And the black stone is called um, camel coal. It's a very hard bituminous coal, suitable for building. So it's not going to break down in the weather. But again, it must have been plentiful and cheap. So he's building with coal and recycled glass in the 1950s. That's just really, really strange. And if you look at his other, all the details, he's, he's pulling in just, there's, yeah, this building is fairly restrained. This one is kind of residence. But this next one is, oh, this one's just, I had to put it in, it's just so wonderfully strange. I mean, it's this curved wall with the, you know, roof, roofing tiles. That's the wall surface, and then as it curves around, you've got this glazed green brick, and it's, he would just, go love geometries that often was geometric motifs within his work. But um, this is the most famous house of his, the Bavinger House, which is in, in Norman, Oklahoma. And the client was an ex-Navy pilot, so they probably hit it off pretty well. And these are some of the early drawings in the house itself. This is a crazy thing. I mean, again, 1955, this is just coming out of nowhere. But you can see the glass, there's some of the coal as a material, this other stone. I mean, there's just there's a lot going on in here. And the interior is, it's hard to find a good interior shot, but everything's wide open under that spiraling roof. And then these concrete pods are hung from that with this weird netting. And it's just, it's just, all, and you see the glass, all this, it's just really this sort of fantastical landscape. But um, Bruce Goff, he was, he was just greatly respected by his peers and a, a very much loved teacher at Oklahoma. Um, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead too quick. Um, so it's interesting to hear what Jones says about Goff. Um, this is a, a quote from Jones. He said, being in contact with Bruce Goff for a couple of years as he was teaching, open eyes to many things, especially intangible things that architecture is so involved with. He could talk about rhythm in architecture, scale, proportion, things that you could build on. He could talk about space and light and form in ways that seem to be a coming together of these ideas. He's been a very strong influence on my work over the years, but I've tried, just as in Wright's work, not to be a copyist, but to reference the principles, thoughts, and ideas that underlie his architectural composition. I've learned as much from Goff as I did from Frank Lloyd Wright. That was news to me. So it's really kind of interesting. And there's a quote in one of the books, one of Jones's um, colleagues at the university said he felt like Goff opened Jones unconscious. And that's what he was, Goff had that gift of being one of those kind of teachers. Um, so, I want one last little tidbit about Dr. Goff. When he was 12 years old, sorry, this is way out of context, it just mm -hmm. thought occurred to me. He, his father, he, was, he, was kind of, he was quite precocious and a real project. He was so his father thought. <laughs> so he took him to an architect's, the biggest architecture firm in Norman, Oklahoma. They were doing big government buildings. And they said, I think you should, and his father said, I think you should hire my son. And they hired him. At 12 years old, so by the time he's 15 or 16, he's designing buildings, big brand buildings in Oklahoma. It's a crazy story, I'm telling you. You've got to look them up. So, 
So a couple of other influences, and then we'll get back to Wright and organic architecture. But Jones really did love history, and he studied modernism, and he admired the modernist architects. And the ones, several that were most influential to him in his own words were Richard Neutra. Many of you have heard of him. He had his practice mostly on the West Coast. And Jones loved the way he, he, he could um, help he work with landscape, and the buildings were always so carefully sighted, sort of embedded in the landscape. And also, he was so good at this, the transparency between the inside and outside. That was really influential on Jones. Um, a few others who he also states had significant impact on him at that time, Arnold Hamilton Harris, who, again, is not a household name. And just oddly enough, I know this sounds like six degrees of separation, but he was our neighbor when we lived in Raleigh. An undergraduate school was really strange. He was quite old at that time. Again, very genteel, nice person. But he was he was doing some really interesting things. Harris had been a student of Neutra's, and I think here his work you can see it, it is much more sculptural. The engineering was probably of great interest to to Jones, and uh, Harris was also exceedingly good on the details. I see working drawings in his house when this was in the 1970s that he would be working on. And uh, he would draw every single stud. He would draw every single piece of wood in the house. And that's the way he was just that scrupulous. And so that way of designing a building was no doubt a big influence. And then the other California, a lot, a lot of California connections, Bernard Maybach, who, um, he was a very eccentric, interesting, he was, you can almost, this is probably a kind of a um, opportunistic comparison, but he was kind of Bruce Goff like in that his, he, he, he repurposed materials. He was not, you see a lot of historical references, but they were not particularly academic. They were always searching for some better way to, to achieve something. Uh, so he was just, he was very, um, again, they're all kind of in the same spirit. And you could also, the, the link that ties them all together is this philosophy of organic architecture. So, um, and, and sorry, Charles and Henry Green, who also uh, California, Pasadena area, uh, area, they too were part of that same school. They were not considered a school or a movement or an ism, but they were all very much working from the same principles, doing similar, with similar concerns. Okay. Um, So, uh, let's see, I'll jump away ahead on my slides here. So let's, yeah, so organic architecture, let's um, get a little bit of discussion of that, because this really is essential to all of the architecture you've seen so far and to Jones's work. Um, so it is organic architecture that really connects all of these architects, particularly Wright, Jones, and Blue Scott. And Wright was the most devoted advocate. He wrote, Wright wrote prolifically Many of his books, his organic architecture, is sort of at the heart of all that. And the term, we've all heard the term forever and ever, but it's a pretty elusive term. Um, it has roots in the late 18th century, William Blake, um, 19th century romantics like Blake, philosophers Schopenhauer and Emerson, um, who look for interconnections in nature at all scales. Um, I think the nicest definition of organic architecture is this next one by Jones. However, Frank Lloyd Wright could have said it. It's directly from him. So this is quoting Jones. Organic principles are not rules. They are really more aims and goals. For a thing to be organic, it has to have a generating idea, and every part and piece has a part to play. Each then should benefit the other. There should be a family of form, a family of pattern, such as the whole is to the part, as the part is to the whole. That's a really great, succinct definition of organic architecture. And again, Wright has written that in different ways. Um, so <clears throat> let's put up this first image of one of Jones' early houses. This is a 1958 Walton residence. Um, I'm going to read another quote here that, again, bear with me, this is not Jones, but this is written by Robert Ivey, who wrote the definitive monograph of Jones, and it's one of the books on that list that I gave you. 
but it's, I think these help bring into focus the number of things you're going to look at. Uh, <clears throat> and right in Jones' understanding of organic architecture, no decision is more important than where a building rests in the landscape. Jones's houses typically follow Wright's dictum that a house should not be on the land, but of the land. Nature, according to Jones, accepts human intervention, responding well to idealizing. Thus, it is permissible to dam streams and produce ponds of water and waterfalls, as he did at the Walton residence that you see here. Says Jones, ideally, you'd like to have it look like man and nature carefully arranged everything by mutual agreement, and each benefited immeasurably from the other. I really like that quote. Uh, going on with Robert Ivey's uh, fidelity to nature and therefore to truth is organic architecture's touchstone. Wright maintained that organic architecture should grow and evolve naturally. Buildings, according to Wright, should emerge from the ground with a sense of belonging and the dignity of the trees. While the Indo-European root of the word truth signifies tree, Jones has a rather inelegant quote here. He says, Jones says, organic architecture does not mean having a building look like a bush. Um, rather, it is the central generator. To both Wright and Jones, the goal is natural harmony, harmony integration, not imitation. So, I think if we go through and look at some of these houses, I have about half a dozen houses in the latter slides are of the chapels. Um, so we'll go through these, and you can see, I think it's interesting to see the evolution. The early ones, like this Walton house, are very much in the manner of Wright. You can see in this floor plan the damming of the creek to create the pond. Kind of ties back into the quote we were talking to, or, or I was reading from. But, um, yeah, so it's, it, it's, these are writing forms, but kind of simpler and pared down on the exterior. When you get to the interior, they really take on a writing character with the natural woods and the use of the stone and the big flagstone flooring that's pure right. And yet, Jones, you can see with the exposed beams, this, this use of structure is one thing that consistently starts to differentiate Jones's work from Wright's. Again, even this early building was really wonderful use of natural light, sort of hidden sources in some places, often coming in from the ridge line of the, of the roof. And yet you're really enveloped. There's a real interior quality to it of a heavy stone and exposed wood. So this is a little bit of a jump. So this is about 10 years later. This house is called Stoneflower. And it was designed for two landscape architects. So it's, it's a weekend house. So it's very tall and skinny, and if you're if you know Thorn Crown Chapel, which you've already seen, you might correctly think, wow, this is sort of similar in character to that. And and Jones says this house kind of became the prototype for Thorn Crown, although there are other influences that we'll talk about. But this house has this very tall, lofty upper level, and then this the grotto-like space. Um, down below, which is they call a garden room, and there's a bathing grotto. So here's this view from that extended deck, again, a long uh, rectilinear plan, very similar to uh, Thorn Crown, but much smaller. There's the lower level. So two very different worlds, this rock grotto. And this little exploded uh, axonometric drawing on the right, you can see how these things sort of fit together. But um, this house is pretty significant, I think, because again, it's this to me it's not particularly writing. It begins to he's he's developing his own persona. And yet he's still very much sticking with and guided by his organic principles. So unfortunately, this house, there's not many images of it. It's it's the Reed residence in Hog Eye, Arkansas. And, Roy Reed uh, is the brother of Jim Reed, who was a client for Thorn Crown Chapel. So they had a, a mutual friendship with Jones. But this too, I think, is, again, you can begin to see some of the influences that are sort of right in, but this is beginning to go, I think, you can make connections, much more, much better connections to probably a lot of the vernacular architecture that Jones grew up with in the mountains of Arkansas. This is essentially a very, elegant and sophisticated barn. 
Um, I don't have, couldn't find any good interior shots, but it's fairly open, and you can kind of tell from some of those drawings that it is, has that foreign-like quality on the interior. But again, he's developed, he's began to develop his own voice. This was one of the houses I did get to visit on my trip there, the Edmondson house. Um, this is kind of an unusual one. This is in 84, so again, moving ahead in time. Um, this one um, is stucco, which I have only stucco building I'm familiar with of uh, John C. May have done more, but I really like this photo. This is the entry sequence, and while some of the detailing and the elaboration of these, of the geometry and pattern, can, you can see a writing influence. He's developing, again, his own language for this kind of thing. And I think having such a choreographed entrance into this house is also very writing, right? Would take you towards, towards your destination, make you turn left, go straight, turn right, go up, go down, so you really experience the larger environment before you arrive at the front door, and this house very much does that. This couple was terribly embarrassed to have me there, I do, I do remember that. <laughs> it was a little uncomfortable. Uh, not, maybe embarrassed is the wrong word. Not so happy that they had this. Um, again, the site plan, you can you see the, the, the um, entry-level plan, and the driveway, and the parking court, and all that. It's very hard to read this, I'm sure. But the Jones, Jones was... He was not a landscape architect, but he was so attuned to how to make, to make these houses of the land. That can sound kind of like a cliche, or like, well, that's, what does that mean? I think what it means, or you can look at his work and kind of see what it means, rather than say what it means. Okay, so this next house, they start to get really kind of out there. This one's in Colorado, a, little, a year later, 85. Um, so what, how can you really account for this range of work? It's, um, it's great to, to hear Jones' own words when he talks about it. So he has this a wonderful um, couple of sentences here that I think are worth hearing. Um, first, when in designing a house, first it's talking with the client in great detail of why they want to build. And why, why do they want to build here? Then it's analyzing winds, the pathway of the sun, the features of the site, whether there is a stream or a view, a boulder or an outcropping, and then it's working to make functional arrangements of the spaces they want. I've never thought that each project has to be an unusual house, a different house. I think each site is going to be different enough. The owners are going to be different enough. Their desires, their patterns of living are going to be different enough that if you solve the problems that they are presented by the project, then it's going to turn out to be different from any other house. It's pretty nicely put, in my opinion. And I think those same comments, when we get to his chapels in a minute, he did so many of them, and the challenge was the same. How do I make them different? I don't want to repeat Thorn Crown Chapel ten times over, so how, how do I do that? And I, I don't have any real insight on that other than to go back to this quote. Every location was different, the client was different, the particular purpose was different. So this house, though, is, is a really kind of strange one to me. If I, I've never seen the floor plan of the house. I've seen some other ones, but so it's a very unusual plan. And yet, when you get in the interior, it kind of comes together in a very Faye Jones-like way. And again, this is a pretty classic one in terms of the structural expression that you see a little bit in that barn house in Hawkeye, in Arkansas, but you see it much more clearly on the interior of this one. All the columns and bracings, that is not Frank Lloyd Wright. He would not do that. Um, this is the last house I'm going to show, and it's, I doubt you were, and I didn't really intentionally do this, but I kind of observed, once I put these houses together, that the earliest house I, I showed you was probably the most right in in its sort of uh, appearance and just the aesthetics of it. And then he went through that long, excuse me, long period of really developing his own voice, and this very last house it did, which is the Thomas Monahan residence. Monahan was the owner of Domino's Pizza. And 
cherishes his privacy, so it's very hard to get the photographs. You can't let him. But this house, to me, is the most writing of all the ones we've seen, and yet it was done in 1992. And it has been built. There's just this, again, it's a private residence that they keep it that way. Okay, so we'll move on to the chapels in the pavilion, the Storm Crown. Of course, this is the uh, first one that really made him famous, and that this, it, it, was, it, was, it resonated in such a profound way. And so, you know, where did it come from? How did you do this? Is it, is it doing is it a barn? Is it this or that? And Jones really did study history. He loved history. And he says, on multiple occasions, that Saint-Chapelle in Paris was a big influence in him. And the buildings are quite similar. They're tall and narrow. Saint-Chapelle is about 32 feet wide. Thorn Crown is 24. Uh, Thorn Crown is 62 feet long. Saint-Chapelle is 99 feet. But this is where it's really interesting to me. So this, this, this is a beautiful, beautiful space. But um, a, a sort of a, a, it's not a really a theory. It was a concept that Jones liked to employ that he called the, op, the operative opposite. And this is a good illustration. So in St. Chapelle, typical kind of Gothic building, although a very elegant one, the structure that's holding all these this glass and columns is really on the outside. So there are these buttressed big piers, and of course we all know other Gothic cathedrals that have flying buttresses. And so all that structure is on the outside of the building. So in the case of the Thorn Crown, Jones had the limitation here imposed by the client that there couldn't be any heavy equipment. The only materials that could be used to build this had to be carried in by hand. So it's like, wow, okay, how do we make this happen? So this is where the operative opposite comes in. He and his partner at that time, or his, who became his partner, Maurice Jennings, figured out a way to pull the structure of this essentially very Gothic building, this repetitive cross-section, they pulled it inside with these little two-by-fours. So all that heavy, massive bracing that's supporting Saint-Chapelle and other Gothic buildings, he brings it, God, sorry, he brings it in with wood and these <coughs> tension on I shouldn't talk with my hands. Um, my wife is giving me a bad eye. Um, yeah, so that, I think it's a great illustration of that operative opposite. And that didn't happen on every project, but when it, where it really, when it made sense, that was, that's where his mind would go. The hardware piece, those two welded, the welded plates, the four pieces there, that's what connects these uh, two by fours. And that was, they came up with that for very practical reasons. They weren't trying to create this visual effect. Um, they were trying to connect these two by fours and keep them in the same plane, rather than having them overlap. Like in the Stoneflower house, that was the prototype. It's a much simpler overlapping of these members. Here, for other practical reasons, they needed them to be in the same plane. They came up with this, and I remember Jones, when we went out to the construction site, they, they had a couple of these pieces there for people to look at. <coughs> and he said, that's the best $2 piece of hardware we could have ever designed. And you can see on the subsequent buildings he used it quite frequently. So there you see the floor plan. You'll see this repeated in the other chapels, a very similar, this narrow, vertical, rectilinear space. This is how they built all the, the uh, Cross bracing on the ground, all in a single plane, tip them up. You can see on the right, very fuzzy photos. And let me take you through. Um, this, the, the chapel is so successful that had so many people coming in that the owner had to build another chapel adjacent to it, like 100 yards away. But they cited it so you really don't see one to the other, and they intentionally wanted it to be very different. I'm sorry, there's some details of one outside. This is the caretaker's cottage. Um, early drawings, very right. So this is the Thorn Crown Worship Center. So this is kind of the opposite of Thorn Crown in that it's a very closed-in um, sanctuary space oriented to the altar with a view out to the mountains. You can see in the drawing on the other right, it's actually elevated with 
columns out as it goes down the hill. So it is it's kind of an inversion of thorn crown in a sense, but still very beautifully detailed. Same incredible attention to connections and how, how things join together. So, I, think I love this photograph. It illustrates his problem. His problem was that he designed these buildings that everybody wanted one. And, that's, and, and he talked about it when I was there. He said, I, I'm not really sure what to do. This is, I'm getting calls from all over the country, and I can't repeat myself. I don't know. You know I'm still trying to figure this out. So, as we see these last few buildings, you can see how he decided to figure it out. So, the next significant one, this is Mildred Cooper uh, Chapel built six to seven years after the Thorn Crown. And I don't know the particulars about the client or anything, but the real difference here between this and Thorn Crown is that this, all this framing is steel, it's steel channels, very small, four inch steel channels paired together, capturing the horizontal between them. And you notice too, there's there's none of that cross bracing that comes into this, comes down low, and that's due to the nature of the steel and how it's detailed. It's, it's accomplishing the support of those walls much tighter and closer to the wall itself, keeping the space, the sanctuary space, much more open. And these, I'm sorry, I don't have color photographs. I really, this was taken by Timothy Hursley, who was. A good friend of Jones and photographed a lot of his buildings, but he loved black and white. But they um, they're painted this beautiful kind of dull gold color. It's just a just a really beautiful space. This was we went. This was under construction when I was there. It was all on the ground, but they had all the channels and the painting and everything that had been done. This is a, just a detail of an office close by the chapel. Okay, a few more, then we'll be at the end. Uh, you'll see these subsequent ones, and you'll see some of the similar details repeated, but I, I think, I was really pretty, quite convinced that there is fundamentally, there's different character and atmosphere in each of these chapels. The simple gable form is repeated, the long linear space, but each one does develop its own character, and so it becomes different by the nature of its location, and so on. So this one's in Whittier, California. This one is a little different. It has these kind of aisles, upper aisles on the second level. That's the only one I've seen quite like that. You still see that hardware being used. Lots of people get married here. I discovered that on the internet. <laughs> um, somewhat similar one, this was in Fort Worth, Texas. The real difference of this building is that it's brick. So the structure on the exterior walls are, is brick. Um, it also has kind of a transept when you get into the space. You can kind of see it on the, there's a lower beam on the right and the left, and there's a little bit of space. So there's more of a cross-shaped plan. So that's kind of a variation on these long rectilinear buildings. So the last building I have here is Pinecote Pavilion, which is in Picayune, Mississippi. And these two sketches here done by North Carolina architect uh, Frank Harmon, who um, I have his, he has a great blog called nativeplaces.org. And he's, goes, he does sketches of all his travels and writes these short little paragraph or two. It's really quite nice. I, I recommend you look it up. So I, I couldn't find a plan of the pine code, but the upper right shows the, you're looking kind of down on that gable roof, and the brown blue is the, is the water, the pond, and the green is the land. So you can see it's sitting out into the pond, and you approach it through the woods. And this is an arboretum. It's called the Crosby Art Arboretum. This is the space that's used for just it's a multi-purpose kind of outdoor pavilion. Lots of different things happen there, day and night. But it's an amazing what I think just the simple gable form, which is one of the most common things for any of us to see, and yet he makes it something really significant. So I have a final quote in the brief epilogue. This last quote is, I think really speaks to his work about as good as 
anything I could. Um, and it's very short. I've, I've always felt that details are more than just nice things to notice. They're a measure of the intensity of caring. And for all architects, caring should be a moral imperative. And I say with no hesitation, that shows up in every single building we've looked at. So, um, Jones died in 2004, and his partner, Maurice Jennings, still carries on the practice. Um, it's funny, I found this chapter, and I thought, I didn't know that Faye Jones had died then. I thought, that doesn't quite look like me. It's very strange. Something's different about it. And that was after he died. So, Jones and his partner are kind of experimenting, doing skylights a little differently, these red skylights. So, they're, they're trying to develop their own voice, I think, but still sticking with these principles. And this is one of his current practice. Maurice Jennings has teamed up with his son, so they're now partners. And this is the most recent one that I'm familiar with. And it's, again, it's interesting to see the variations where you have this big stone wall, it's asymmetrical, all the structure that are cables, so it's all tension. It's not wood. Um, yeah, so, so they're, they're, they're exploring that engineering path and trying to develop some, their own language. So there's Fay Jones, uh, probably taken in about 1990. And I'll read the sort of, it's almost like a really mini eulogy that Robert Ivey has in his book. Um, so this is from Robert Ivey. Jones carefully crafted work for a few individuals focusing on the slow pace of human touch may seem anachronistic. Yet, in another sense, his work may seem prophetic. By pursuing a humane architecture at home with nature, non-intrusive, respectful of place, harmonizing with elemental forces, Jones reminds us that we are merely visitors in Eden and that we should tread lightly here. Thank you very much. Outside, if you want to leave the building or whatever. So I'm happy to talk to you about it. Thank you.